Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 12th of October 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on board and a um, lot going on, of course, a uh, lot to talk about tonight. And um, you know, as with all of these things, plenty of things to think about. But, um, you know, before I start, let me just do what I always do, which is just remind you that uh, this isn't financial or legal advice in any way. Uh, we, please play nice in the chat room. We do moderate uh, the stream. Uh, this is as at the 12th of October 2021. If you're watching in replay, um, use at what the world if you want to get my attention. And we've also enabled super chat if uh, you would like to make your question come to the top of the list or indeed want to support our work. And I want to thank those who've already made some super track contributions tonight so far. It really is appreciated. It does help to cover some of the costs of making the shows and doing all that we do here. Um, it does cost a bit of money, so it's really helpful to have a bit of support from the community. So thank you very much. And uh, if I don't uh, uh, further acknowledge individual contributions, I will try, but uh, it gets a bit busy on the chat sometimes, but I really is appreciated and uh, every contribution is gratefully received. Now, with that brief introduction, um, I'm going to bring uh, Tanya Lecantro in. Tony, are you there? I certainly am, Martin, and it has been a while, so I'm probably a little bit rusty, but I'll get into it. Yeah, great to see you there. Mm. And, uh, you know, you're over in Perth, um, you know, three hours behind us, completely different world in terms of uh, COVID and everything else. So it'll be very interesting to get your perspective on, um, you know, what's going on and uh, where, where we're headed. Um, but I guess, um, as with all these things, um, what is your sort of you know, top of thought, top of mind thoughts in terms of what you see. And you might also just want to give for people a bit of background on yourself and uh, out of capital and things just as we go into this. Oh, for sure. Well, I'm from Perth, uh, which Barnaby Joyce refers to as North Korea. So, yeah, life here's been uh, pretty good, viewers. I managed to get to the AFL Grand Final, um, thanks to Melbourne for that. And that, that was uh, one of the best days of my life. So, yeah, life's normal. I've been enjoying the restaurants here. Uh, pretty much we're in freedom. But I am mindful that, you know, once Delta comes here, uh, it, it's going to be, for better words, you know, a bit of a bit of a shit show. So, yeah, so I, um, I was born northern beaches of Sydney, grew up. I used to surf Curl Curl Beach all the time. I went to St. Pius in Chatswood. I, I did well at school, uh, joined the New South Wales Police Service, uh, got to know the whole of Sydney, got, got to know the psychology of markets, the, the psychology of people, taught myself the stock market while I was a police officer. Uh, luckily, I got to work around Bondi. And I bring this story up quite a bit that when I bought a unit in Bondi, I actually bought that unit 400 metres from the beach at 2.4 times my average police wage. And this was uh, just as we were coming out of a recession. So I did that and I've been a financial advisor slash broker since 1998. And all I focus on is small cap stocks. So basically I look at companies that, small companies that become bigger ones and I'm looking for that home run uh, bases loaded. So that's a bit about me. I, I love looking at economics. I love psychology. I love speculation bubbles. I am about to lose a bet with Stephen Kakoulis. Uh, I made a bet that house prices would drop 35% within three years. Unfortunately, my crystal ball and my clairvoyant didn't predict COVID. So I'm sacking her. And come February next year, I'm going to owe Kukulis $2,500. And I'm just going to take that. I'm not going to set up a GoFundMe page like that streaker at the AFL or, yeah. I'm just going to cop it sweet, Martin, because a bet is a bet. But I will remind viewers that during that bet, at one point it, I was on track to win that bet and then this hideous virus came along and suddenly... The median price in Sydney got to $1.3 million. And who would have thought a global pandemic can make everyone millionaires? 
<laughs> well, of course, that's thanks because mm. all of these um, central banks with their money printing and le liquidity and all of those schemes to get more people to buy into property and all those weird things, right? So, uh, yeah. you know, who would have predicted that they would actually throw as much money as they have into it? And it's interesting just reflecting, isn't it, Tony? If you think how much has been uh, thrown into the economies around the world, you know, trillions and trillions, and yet growth is still grinding along the bottom. So other than house price expansion and stock price expansion, there isn't much to show for it, really, is there? Oh, it's just, it's just the greatest speculative bubble of all time. And what we have, you know, of course, we have crypto, NFTs, uh, Woolworths brick collections, uh, an old uh, rally car in a garage that sells for a couple of mil. It, the world has gone absolutely crazy. We have a global housing bubble due to cheap money and stupidity. And it, it's all pretty much, it's all going to end in tears because every bubble bursts. And what, what I've elected to do, Martin, is uh, join the STFU. I've kept my mouth shut. I've just watched this stupidity evolve. And um, I've got my own strategies on how I'm going to live the rest of my life. And I'm quite, I'm going to be quite honest tonight and share exactly what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I've got to remind viewers that, or state to viewers that, you know, only five years ago, um, I was broke. You know, I, I just, yeah, you know, I've been through two divorces. So you lose 80% on your first divorce, you lose another 80%, and then you pay $60,000 a year child support. So, um, you know, anyway, I'll have some good suggestions. Yeah, no, great. And a few people have been asking, is that the small cap guy? Well, sort of, but also some of the bigger caps now because they've grown a bit, right? So um, why don't we um, do this, uh, Tony? You've prepared a few slides and I think it'd be a good thing if you um, walk us through those slides now because it will give us a bit of a context to answer some of the questions. There's already a bunch of questions there, but uh, I'm sure there's yeah, the two. Yeah, I'm as predictable as an ACD song or a wiggle song. I always, what I've done tonight is I have not written a word in my slideshow. I'm useless with putting together presentations. But anyway, here goes. So yep, this is the good. topic uh, we're investing now. Uh, that's today's date. So here's the disclaimer. Uh, this is quite crucial because it is general advice. It's not tailored to your needs. So read that disclaimer in your own at your own leisure. So what, what I've learned uh, recently is I've learned a combination of death and, and dementia. Uh, my father passed away on the 24th of June after a five-day battle, battle with pancreatic cancer. He must have had it prior to that. And the next day, I had to put my mum in a dementia ward. And as you can see, that quote below, I think sums up my parents' life because my father used to write down every cent he spent. He was such a frugal person, saved everything, would uh, procrastinate over buying a pair of socks. And, and suddenly, you know, his life's over. And, uh, you know, mum... In a, in a dementia ward, uh, that's a very sad place. I was there a couple of days ago, and it's just, it really breaks my heart as to someone that, such a beautiful mum, and suddenly she's in that dementia ward. And I, I make the point, uh, if you don't take anything away from this discussion, uh, viewers, is that get some advice on estate planning. Uh, I, I sent my mum into a nursing home. Um, she had a certain amount of assets. And I think get advice on to how much your parents or yourself needs to go into an aged care facility because if she would go in with $51,000 in assets, with her pension, she'd be cash flow positive. So what I'm saying is seek independent advice. But I think this is a... A consideration, viewers, that we need to look at having that conversation with your kids, planning ahead, not going out and putting assets in different names. You've got all the gifting rules. But if I'd had known how the aged care system worked a few years ago, it would have saved me a lot of heartache. 
And I, you know, I'm just saying, go out and get that advice because my experiences with my father dying and putting my mum in a home, I, I think I could have done it better, but I guess you need to prepare for these, these events. And it, it's funny how it takes you know, death and dementia to skew my view of life. And, uh, and my opinion is that I am going to go into a nursing home, stone motherless broke. I'm going to give my kids a financial education. I'm going to enjoy the, hopefully the millions of dollars I make on my stocks. And, and that's it. You know, I'm 50 now. Maybe I've got 10 high quality years ahead of me. But yeah, at, again, I just want to go into that nursing home um, and broke. And I guess once you research it, uh, that's where people should be. Now, on Saturday, I, I bought a house. So it's not uh, Ben Damon, Damon, Matt Damon, sorry, in I bought a zoo. I actually bought a house. Now, Part of the reason why I bought a house was if you look at that rental below, that's I want to live in the Mount Hawthorne area. For those unaware, Mount Hawthorne is roughly about four to five kilometers from Perth CBD. It's like it's it's like an attractive version of Strathfield. But what was happening is I I have a dog, um, that creature on the right hand side, and hell or high water, I could not get a rental. And I'm looking at between $35,000 and $50,000 a year to rent something that's old, crappy, where I'm not going to be happy. So uh, just out of stupidity, I went looking at some properties and I found one. And as soon as I walked in, I thought, this, this is home. So people say, well, Lacantro, you're crazy. Aren't you a property bear? Well, the point is that I have a son. I have a partner who wanted something more than a one-bedroom unit. So to me, it was a lifestyle decision. I bought this property at 1.5 times price to income, my personal ratio. And you've got to look at it. You know, Sydney, you're paying 14 times. But even though I'm a high income earner, the banks have put me through the absolute ringer. And I just don't know how anyone in Sydney could buy a property at the median price of $1.3 million without bullshitting the banks. Because, you know, I'm quite honest and open. My mortgage will be about the average size in WA. But if, if you look at those fixed rates, what what I've done by buying this property, getting out of a rental, selling my property now, I'm looking at repayments less than two grand a month. And for five years, I'm going to fix it for five years and I'm going to have an absolute ball from living from 50 to 55. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to have a midlife crisis. I'm not going to buy a sports car and go out with a trophy woman. I mean, I've already got one of them. So, yeah, I thought, what the hell? Let's fix it for five years. Let's enjoy life. I think I've bought extremely well. I bought a property that's six kilometres from the centre of Perth, 10 kilometres to the beach, five kilometres to a mammoth shopping centre. And, again, I paid 1.5 times what I earn. I've cut my living costs more than in half. And, and, and life's good. So that's my argument for doing this. If, if rates go to the moon after five years, I'll deal with that problem. But my intention is that my small cap investments should ensure that I have a minimal mortgage, if any, and the interest rates won't be too much higher. But, you know, uh, the RBA said that they're not going to lift to 24 2024, well, tell them that they're dreaming because you look at the inflationary pressures, you look, you look at what the long-term RBA cash rate is, and that's 6%. The average mortgage repayment in the long term is over 9%. So this, there's no precedent for what we're seeing. 
But, you know, I'm, I'm happy to cop a lot of crap in the comments. I'm happy for people to call me trailer park trash, a traitor to the cause. But to me, that was the right decision. And, and what I've done is I've bought well below my means. I'm not a suburb snob. I don't want to live in Dalkeith, Netherlands or Claremont. But what I've done is a lifestyle decision for me and my family. And I think I've done the right thing. So, so what we're seeing now is global property stupidity. Uh, that, that figure is fairly recent, but if you believe the $1.3 million median price in Sydney, that price to income ratio is actually 14 times. Can you believe that? You, you look at the long-term price to income ratio and it should be four to six times. So, you know, you look at the average in Perth, which is about six times. Historically, you know, that's still expensive. But to me, this, this is an absolute market just rife with stupidity. Uh, you know, you look at the average, the median price in St. Ives, I, I would have thought it was about 1.8 million. So I went on to realestate.com and it's $2.6 million. Uh, that's, that's just crazy and I think reflects the global property bubble that we're experiencing. And, um, you know, even though I'm going to lose that bet with Kook and I'm going to have to transfer $2,500 to his bank account in February next year, I just think that this market is batshit crazy. There's no real sense to it. And I think viewers need to remember that in 2006, Perth was actually more expensive than Sydney. Admittedly, we don't have the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House, but to me, uh, I spent 28 years in Sydney, eight of them as a police officer. You know, I'd, I'd rather live in Perth. I don't care about having a vibrant nightlife. I don't care about the rocks or the Harbour Bridge. To me, life is too short to pay for a view or a friggin' opera house in my opinion anyway. So, you know, this slide I've used before, I just think that, you know, this bubble, every asset class is defying gravity and every bubble will burst. And to me, buying these liquid assets is like a cray pot. Sure enough, if you can lie to the bank, get a loan from your parents, go to a loan shark, get into an overpriced mortgage, but suddenly you try and get the hell out of it. These things, when the market sentiment turns, they're near impossible to get out of. And I've seen that through every speculative bubble, including the Asian crisis, dot-com and other bubbles. So to me, if you're going into property at the top, uh, it, it's, a, it's a lobster pot because what I say to people is once spring comes, once these lockdowns ease, it's going to be like sucking an ocean through a straw when you come up with that supply. Because uh, one of my clients actually has just opened up a real estate business in, in Melbourne. And he was saying that already, you know, just over a month's time, he's got 21 listings and those listings are going to grow. So what I'm, what I'm thinking is once... Once, uh, you know, we have freedom, people have the right to list their property. It, it's going to be an absolute bloodbath and buyers will retreat. And then, you know, you've got this massive correction. So I think one, what, what I've noticed is even though I am a high income earner due to the fact that I work hard, I'm dealing with banks to buy my property at one and a half times my income. Suddenly, I don't know how the hell people in Sydney and Melbourne are getting mortgages when, you know, the average loan for the bank of mum and dad is approaching $95,000. And that is an absolute domino waiting to, to happen. It's waiting to fall. When you think about you know, I've got three kids. Admittedly, it's cost me an absolute shitload in child support. But if one of my kids rang up and said, I want to buy a house, I've got one kid in Sydney, one in Tasmania, one here. 
you know, I'd say, well, wait a second, I'll give you a financial education, but you're not getting any equity in my property and I'm not handing over any money because you think about it, if, you know, these kids are more likely to default on their mortgage than kids that have worked hard and saved their money. And I think that anyone on a $1.3 million mortgage that has saved $260,000 for their deposit is completely full of shit. Um, there's no way known to man you can save that amount of money. I just think that the books are totally cooked and, you know, where it's a disaster waiting to happen. So anyway, sorry, Martin, I stole that slide, but I think that's really an important slide when it comes to what we're about to be faced with because not only are the kids going to default, but the parents who have worked hard all their lives, admittedly they've won lotto with through inertia, are going to be forced to start realising some assets and that could extend to their own properties. So let, let's look at the risk. So look at that, look at that 10 year bond rate. And the RBA says no interest rate increases to 2024. I'll tell them they're dreaming. Look at that average mortgage size in New South Wales. I think the average mortgage in New South Wales is approaching $800,000. You know, try mixing that with a mortgage repayment of, say, 6 to 8% and a decline in your house value between 30 and 40%. I hope um, we're paying Lacantro bingo here, Martin, because, I mean, that's the economic equivalent of being sandpapered to death. That, to me, is the perfect storm of heading to bankruptcy. And I think, you know, I, I don't want to sound condescending or in any way, but, the, you know, the clear lack of financial education in this country is frightening. Everyone wants to be a sheep. Everyone wants to impress people with these big houses that no one really cares about. And I look at the CPW ratio. Um, I, I liken it to close, which is cost per wear, and it's cost per wow. You know, you invite someone over to look at your McMansion and they say, wow. And you've got to look at how much each wow costs you. Let's, let's not forget Evergrande. So this... You know, this was only a couple of hours ago. So these bondholders haven't received any money whatsoever. So again, everyone really is asleep at the wheel. And that's what we're looking at is one of the biggest property collapses in China that has the chance of causing some serious contagion. So people that think that, hey, sentiment can keep going, well, you've only got to look at the iron ore price that, that can get cut in half in absolutely no time. So, you know, interest rate pressures, hey, they're going up. I don't care what the RBA says. If you're going to whack down inflation, it's like trying to hold down a beach ball in a public pool. It wants to go higher. To me, all the, the inflationary pressures are there and the only real effective tool is to lift interest rates and as i said at the start the average rba cash rate is six percent now we're at 0.1 admittedly on melbourne cup day where we've all had a skinful and the ten thousand vats people at the event also had a skinful the rba will probably put rates on hold again but to me rates are going to go up and they're going to go up quickly. And that's why I thought to myself, hey, I'm going to have the best five years of my life because I'm going to fix my frigging mortgage for five years at 2.6%. You know, I don't care about people saying, oh, Lacantro, you bought a house. But to me, the next five years, um, I'm going to enjoy it because, you know, life in a home with no money is fast approaching. So anyway, um, during lockdown or whatever you like to call it, I am looking at some entertainment value. I strongly recommend people read the book 100 Baggers because that 
is what I'm all about when it comes to investment. I'm looking for a company with the potential to increase 100 times in value. Admittedly, the small end of the market has come under a bit of a correction, but I, I've had some stocks that have 10 times in less than a year. I'm, I'm again dealing with the greed factor with my clients who don't want to sell at 10 times profit because they're scared of paying tax. But to me, that book is worth searching for. 99 Homes, I've recommended before. I think the big short is around the streaming services at the moment. People said, why didn't you recommend Margin Call? Well, I am right now. And what I've done is I really love Mr. In-Between. So that's about a gangster. It's got nothing to do with the market. But, um, you know, if you want a bit of a laugh, um, those who have binge, I can strongly recommend that. And the whole world is talking about Squid Game, the Korean-based Netflix drama or gory action series that they believe will be Netflix's greatest series of all time. And I don't want to really spoil it for people, but the moral of that story is that once you become super rich, your highs are going to become lower and you're always looking for that next thrill. And I think that really comes down to how we want to live our lives, who we, you know, who we want to impress. But what I've learned through death and dementia and living with a 9.5 out of 10 is that life is to be enjoyed. You need to do what you want. You need to balance yourself financially and don't go into a mortgage and leverage yourself up to the hilt where all you'll be chasing is Tammy from my budget's phone number when you're in when you're in economic shit. So, I mean, that's that's the moral of that entertainment story. Uh, admittedly, it's probably a little bit off topic, but I'm I'm live on Martin's show, so I can do what the hell I want. So, I think the stock market is about the only place you're going to make some serious money unless you bought a smartly, as I did in Perth, six kilometres from the city where my partner will cook me meals and be grateful for living there and my dog will have a new home and not living in a shitty rental where we're paying $40,000 for no benefit. So anyway, you can look at those stocks and uh, what I see there, let's get straight to Alta Zinc. Uh, I think management are building a real zinc company in northern Italy. They have some of the highest grade zinc concentrates in the world. The guy behind it, Garrett, has built real companies in the past, so I'm not going to bet against him. All you meant is my gold acquisition story. I, I raised money for Northern Star at five cents. That stock 10 years later peaked at $17. These guys from All You Mint worked under Bill Beeman from Northern Star. I've bought a lot of shares. I, I will admit that in order to buy my house, I am going for a 20% deposit. So I've had to sell quite a few shares over the last couple of days, but I haven't touched them. Chimeric Therapeutics is another company that has an interesting CAR-T cancer therapy that they are taking into the clinic and to me looks like a serious biotech company you can buy that for around 29 cents i threw a heap of money at it exafarm is a new exosome company which i helped to float uh, i've still got a lot of stock left admittedly to pay for this friggin house um, i had to sell some so i've honestly i've finished selling it but I still see a massive future for that company. Godolphin is an explorer in New South Wales with massive potential for a huge copper gold discovery. So that looks good. Mako Gold has some gold projects in Cote d'Ivoire, which is the less shittiest of a shitty continent for gold and investment. 
So to me, around 11 cents look, looks pretty good. These gold companies, I know a lot of viewers are into gold and silver, but if you can come up with a million ounces of gold, your market value could go from 80 to $120 million. I think that over time, these guys could come up with 2 million ounces. So go do the research and do the math. Narada, I always cop a lot of fat, flack for this company. I should admit that I helped IPO this company. I'm on the top 20 as a shareholder. I'm not going to be insulted and sell any shares where they're trading at now. But they are developing a statin combined with a PCKS9 inhibitor that reduces cholesterol. Now, every time I bring up uh, cholesterol drug, the anti-cholesterol people get onto me. It's a bit like the anti-vaxxers, but um, ZFG, you know, I don't really care. But uh, one of my clients actually has, he had a heart condition. He had extremely high cholesterol. He, ta he takes an injection of Pralent. It got his cholesterol down to two and a half, but it costs him seven and a half thousand dollars a year for these inject injections. Narada's aim is to create a daily pill. Now, they should be in the clinic next year. The share price is completely on its knees. So, again, well worth researching, viewers. If you actually believe that cholesterol is an issue or you actually believe that COVID is real, M3 Mining going to drill a massive copper target shortly. Hero or zero, but that's the way I like it. Pack Gold, another company I took part in the IPO, drilling a nice project in North Queensland, potentially multi-million ounces of gold. And as I stated earlier, if you come up with a million ounces of gold that is mineable, your market value could range between 50 to $100 million dollars. So, you know, I have, faith, I have faith in management. I have faith in the project. Proteomics have developed a predictive test for chronic kidney disease in diabetes. So this, this predicts if you're going to get chronic kidney disease years before it happens. So that is already been approved. The science actually works. And the company also is developing a test for endometriosis, which affects so many women. I think about one in nine. And endometriosis takes up to 10 years to diagnose and is a major cause of infertility. That stock has come off about $1.30, $1.40. You can buy it around 90 cents. I must disclose that my exposure is incredibly high, but I believe in the company. I'm not going to be a seller around these prices. Now, you know, if you want to hit a home run with bases loaded, you've got to look for a stock like Copper Search. I liken this to buying crypto early. These guys have come from a $2.2 billion takeover in a uranium stock where they accidentally found uranium and they're looking for a BMF copper gold discovery in the Gaula Craton. So to me, if this comes off, if they make that discovery, you're looking at potentially five to 10 times your money. If they don't, um, the share price will get poleaxed into the next postcode. But again, we've got two years of drilling to look for that discovery. And the way I look at markets is that property is cooked unless you buy as smartly as I have. Eastern states in particular, massive falls. Crypto, uh, well, you can gamble as much as you want. I know that one of the most respected, previously most respected people in crypto has been exposed. Uh, a lot of money has been lost. Mind you, whenever Elon Musk opens up his mouth, um, there's a shit ton of money to be made. But to me, you know, if you want to trade that, you want to gamble, you know, you've got Kino, you've got Sportsbet.
to me. Uh, some, some cryptocurrencies are going to be useful. Some of them, we're going to see institutions and funds certainly get involved. But on the whole, um, I think now, I think there was about 6,000 religions. Now there must be well over 7,000 cryptocurrencies. And just like religion, every one of them is right. So they're the stocks I am focused on to hopefully, once I leave my five-year fixed interest rate where my repayments are less than around $2,000 a month, can you believe how cheap money is? Then I might decide to take a tree change, a C change, prior to me going to a nursing home, hopefully not a dementia ward, completely broke, laughing in the fact that I've looked, up, looked after my children, um, where I've paid them a lot of child support over the years. So anyway, they're my top stocks. Take a picture of it. Um, I don't care what people say. I've been investing in these type of stocks since Kurt Cobain shot himself. I've been an advisor for 23 years. I've endured every correction. But what I've learned is that if you've got the right fundamentals, you are going to succeed over time, regardless of the market corrections. So again, the world has gone absolute batshit crazy. The photo on the right is from Kmart, where I believe people queued at midnight to go in and buy absolute rubbish. I must admit, I shop at Kmart. I buy my plates and coffee cups from Kmart. And I've also bought a retro kettle for $17 that looks like a $160 smeg version. So yes, I do into K I go into Kmart occasionally, but I feel violated every time I walk in. Uh, Lindsay David, who is a great economics contributor and commentator, has put that tweet out today. And if you have a look, I mean, that's an absolute joke. And that just goes to show how completely batshit crazy the world has become. So as he said, we're into 285 days of the year, yet this increase has only fallen about 11 times during the year. And to me, that is the most insane speculative bubble you're ever going to see and it's all going to end in tears because it's not going to take an interest rate increase. It's just going to take an exhaustion of buyers. And if the iron ore price can halve in virtually no time, these overpriced dog boxes in Sydney could fall 30 to 40% before you know it. And again, I don't know how the hell banks are going to lend people to get out of financial strife. I think bankruptcy is going to be a great option for a lot of families. And I don't mean to be condescending, but, you know, at times people should look at historical price to income ratios. They should look at what has happened to Ireland. And if you go back to that Morgan Kelly, Jim Powell video, you'll see that even though the economy was strong, Morgan Kelly said house prices would halve and he was spot on. And there's a scene from the riots in Melbourne. Uh, I just can't believe what this country has come to. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories or anything to do with COVID. Um, I had my second Pfizer jab on Friday. I was sick all weekend, which probably contributed to me buying a house. But to me, watching, you know, uh, police spray, pepper spray at people over COVID, to me, is a sad state of affairs. Uh, when I left the police in 1998, uh, we didn't really have pepper spray. It wasn't a cooking ingredient. I simply had a baton and a gun. And the greatest tool of policing, I believe, was my mouth. But now we've got a country that's threatening to go out of control and we still haven't seen the economic hardships of a serious property and banking crisis. 
And I, I, you know, I go back to the dot com bubble where there was irrational exuberance, and suddenly things came off, and indices dropped, and people lost a lot of money. And if if you go back to historic ratios, I think the whole world is totally out of kilter. We are going to open up. People can now list their properties. And again, I'll say it. I'll say it for probably the fifth time in recent memory that the supply side is going to be like trying to suck an ocean through through a straw. And to me, that's an ugly scenario emerging in the Australian economy where we've got retail and uh, entertainment industries that can't get staff, that are struggling, that will close down. So I've used this, I'll use this quote once again. Um, if anyone knows, it's often the third date where you, you look to get a home run. And even though I said this way back in March, I still think that even though property prices, asset prices have gone a lot higher, we are still extremely vulnerable. And again, it just shows that you need to prepare. You know, we've had bubbles ending in IUM and, and really what saddens me with what is happening in the world and in particular Australia, the next bubble is going to end in IUM and that's not going to be a pleasant event. So what I'll do is hopefully I'll work out how to stop share. Anyway, I'm back, Martin. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Tony. Uh, yeah. Well, I can tell you that there are <laughs> a whole bunch of comments in the in, in the chat through that, which we might um, touch on. Um, but look, there was one that um, came in a little while ago, which I'll just put up on the screen. This is actually, um, whoops, get, click on that first. There we go. This is from Jason. And Jason, thanks for the super chat. Because um, yeah. Jason asked the question about APRA, right? Um, and of course, APRA you know, did a little bit of a sort of a, you know, a, a shuffle and sort of moved the, 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 the hurdle rate up, you know, very small, two and a half to three percent. But basically, Jason's question was, do you think APRA is managing the banks, you know, behind the scenes, trying to actually avoid the inevitable crisis? Because both you and I believe that there is a crisis building, right? The question is, what do you think about APRA? Do you think APRA is actually on the case or do you think they're completely avoiding the case? Well, I think I think the the move from two and a half to three percent stress test, uh, you know, it's been it's been dismissed, but that but now we're looking at serviceability towards a six percent mortgage rate, and I just don't understand how that's sustainable. So what what I'm thinking is that these conditions certainly have to tighten, but it's certainly a step in the right direction but a lot of the media commentators have simply shrugged it off. So um, God knows what my mortgage broker has done with my stress test. But as I mentioned, you know, I bought this property at one and a half times my earnings and I've got a shit ton of equity. I've got a lot of cash, but I still feel violated getting that loan. So, you know, I'm actually fearful as to what, people are doing in Sydney and Melbourne to get these loans where, you know, 100 grand's the bank of mum and dad and the rest of it's um, credit cards or God knows how to get the money. So I think APRA is certainly a massive step in the right direction, but to me, it's not enough. Yeah, this is interesting. You know, I, I interestingly, APRA, on the day that they actually gave evidence three or four months ago to one of the... Um, uh, parliamentary committees to say nothing, no, nothing to see here, right? They were privately writing to the bank saying, "Get your lending standards sorted out, right?" So they've got this public face and they've got this private face, right? Um, so I think they've got more of an idea of what's going on than than they actually want to uh, to readily admit. But they're, they're going to have to do a lot more. And of course, in the New Zealand, they put the uh, interest rates up quite recently, um, as they did in Iceland. Um, we've got very loose lending standards. And in fact, UBS republished quite recently their lie loans analysis that showed that 40% of people were telling porkies on their mortgage application form. 
Yeah, and, and if you look at, I actually went to the page on New Zealand mortgages and some of them are like 5.9%. I mean, how can people on the eastern states afford that level of mortgage? Uh, I, I just feel relieved that I'm going to be paying around 2.6. But if you look at an $800,000 mortgage on that sort of interest rate, that's $48,000 a year after tax interest. And to me, that economically, that just doesn't make sense, Martin. No, I agree. And uh, Jason asked about um, APRA. Do they have to disclose what they do? No, they don't. They work behind the scenes. Yeah. Most of the time, APRA's pulling the strings quietly, you know, working with the banks rather than actually um, publicly um, disclosing too much. And in fact, the level of disclosure in Australia in terms of Vertex stress tests, as an example, right, so much lower than in the US, right? So in the US, every year, the Federal Reserve stress tests the banks and they declare the results for each individual banks. Nothing like that here in Australia. So APRA is very much um, behind the scenes and, you know, the level of reporting uh, that's public is, is very, very low relative to most other countries. So that's another part of the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, Master Singleton make, single make the point, made the point um, that APRA is not working as it's been designed to do since inception. Probably true. Um, and you could ask, argue that with APRA and the RBA both saying house prices, nothing to do with us. Well, hang on a moment. If it's not nothing to do with interest rates and lending, mm. right, then effectively that means that it's all about supply side stuff, except there's a lot of spare property around. So credit is driving house prices. Credit is actually a function of lending standards and low interest rates. APRA and RBA totally in the middle of this, and yet they have complete deniability. It's crazy. Well, I'm, I'm petrified of higher rates. So I'm actually about to sell two properties at the moment into a red hot Perth market. And they redid the figures and Perth actually increased 18% last year. And I've done a lot of research and the market here just wants to go completely ape shit. But to me, all I want is a place to live, a place where my partner can walk around naked, cook me a roast. And I, don't, as, I do not want to be a property investor, Martin. I don't want to be in the Daily Telegraph owning 27 properties. All I want is a place to live and a place to build up my wealth, to blow it all and go into an aged care facility, completely stone motherless bro. <laughs> and uh, just to be clear, um, for debt and regret, who I think joined a bit late, um, are you still bearish on property? And the, the answer is yes, but still in certain circumstances, it makes sense to buy. Well, I, I look, I did the figures and I'm thinking, well, 40 grand a year rent to live in somewhere where I can't put a TV on the wall, I can't paint it, and I'm competing with 50 other people in Perth where the vacancy rate is about 1.2%. I thought, stuff it, let's fix it for five years. Let's have an absolute blast for, for the next five years. But yes, I'm bearish on property. Sure, I'm gonna lose a bet with Kook, but who would have predicted COVID? But to me, if you're buying in the Eastern States, you are heading towards bankruptcy. The Perth market, to my mind, wants to go absolutely ballistic for the next 12 months. And I'm seeing it. I've been to home opens. I've looked at the rental market. I mean, we are only catching up. And I think with investors, a lot of them didn't head towards Perth. They went to Hobart. They didn't even visit Adelaide. But I think this is probably Perth's time to shine. And I didn't want to risk paying more. So as soon as I saw the right property, I looked at my partner and said, hey, I'm putting an offer on this straight away and I'm going to halve our living costs so we can go out and go to restaurants. And to me, financial freedom is the three, the three S's. I look at the three pleasures of life are sex, Shiraz and whatever you want. So the freedom to put in your shopping trolley whatever you want. And I, you know, I'm still a value for money person, Martin. I find half price dumplings will raid four cold stores. I'll find tradey deodorant half price. We'll, we'll go and raid it. So to me, life is all about value for money.
Absolutely, and congratulations! You've filled up your um, Tony Lacantro bingo card. Um, you know, I was make, make sure we tick all the ones off, right? So we got the sandpaper. Yeah. And we, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, you know, it's it's a sad state of affairs when people are forced into these situations by you know an irrational market, and who wants to see? You know, families under pressure, uh, suicide rates are through the roof, calls to lifeline are through the roof. Um, there's just no financial education. So, yeah, it's good to win bingo anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Now, here's one from, again, from Des and Regret, which um, I bought 10 acres in southeast Queensland for 30 less than most five acre box. But five acre blocks in the same area just because the house needed some work so do you think the quality of the land is more important than the quality of the house and that actually begs an interesting question right when you buy you know are you buying what's on the land or is it actually the land that's that's more important and you know i guess it depends a little bit but uh what have you got a perspective on that tony oh, what a bloody good question um i think I think if you go back in history, you look at the 1889-1890 land boom that took you know, well over 50 years to break even. And I know like clients or people I talk to that own land in the likes of Orange where it's actually gone through the roof. And what I think is going to happen is people have gone for a tree change, uh, a sea change, and I think that the office environment is going to start to come back. I mean, I was working from home five days a week and I've had an absolute gut full of that. I mean, I need social interaction. So I think regionally, I, I would be a seller, Martin. I think that if you've got, if, if you bought smartly, sell people the dream that they want to be out in the bush, they want to have acres of land that they have to spend money on. I, I just think sell them, sell them the water view sell them the cafe strip and sell them the dream of a rural life because all of those things are going to get discounted once we see a downturn yeah absolutely and uh, i also make the point that um if you think of um you know the high-rise apartments say in sydney and melbourne sure. um what you see there is the values are not actually rising i did some work quite recently looking at north ride and their prices are down about 26% from where they were in 2017, even now, right? And it suddenly struck me that, well, if you're actually buying a high rise, what you're doing is you're buying a bit of strata on a very small piece of land, right? Whereas if you're buying a property on a standalone block, then you've got control of the land and you've got something bigger, and therefore the land actually can be quite, um, you know, can be quite valuable. And I've seen a number of people do quite well by buying um, a largest block with a property that needs significant work relative to those that are buying uh, you know, a bigger property on a smaller block. And of course, the, you know, the average block size is shrinking like you wouldn't believe, particularly in Western Australia. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me that sometimes buying on the bigger plot, even if it's an older property that needs some work, may, may make more sense. And certainly if you look at long-term values, then they seem to me to be holding their value um, and, and growing more quickly than some of the some of the others. But obviously, different locations, different yeah. types of property yeah. all all coming. Somebody asked you uh, as well: yeah. Did you use a buyer's agent, or did you you know just go go yourself and f find this property? Well, I I you know I'm always on realestate.com, and it just got to the point where living in a one bedroom unit with my partner and a dog and a son just didn't work. So I just wrote a list of, of target places and I walked into this place and I thought, this is home. And, you know, as I said before, Martin, I'm 50 years old. I'm going to go into an aged care facility, hopefully not dementia, broke. I've got no interest in buyers agents. Um, I'll follow the Perth market. The pressure on our market is clearly to the upside. You look at houses around Mount Hawthorne, Leaderville, they're selling in, in no time. So I just think we're playing catch up to the eastern states. But, you know, I, I just I don't need a buyer's agent. To me, it was a choice of a place to live, a family home, because I've got zero interest in becoming a property investor. Absolutely. Now, yeah. one of the other things that came up in the in the chat a couple of times was um, uranium, uh, lithium, yep. and other rare, rare earths. Um, what's your perspective there, Tony, with what's happening? 
Well, I, I was fortunate in that we uh, we went to uranium stocks uh, way back, and a number of our uranium plays, uh, EL8 and Bannerman, have actually increased ten times in value. So I've, I actually sold my told my clients uh, to sell. I think the bounce back in lithium has been absolutely stunning. But you've got, you've got to remember that a lot of these companies are just jumping on a bandwagon to fund their lifestyles, to fund salaries, and there's very few companies that will ever get into production of lithium. Admittedly, you've got Oracobra, you've got Pilbara. On the uranium front, you've got Paladin, Deep Yellow. But I, I threw my clients at the deep end in a stock called Elevate at around eight, nine cents that was land banking uranium. They were buying pounds in the ground and that stock went from about eight cents into the 70s. And you also had the hype around the Sprott Uranium Fund where some of the smartest minds in the uranium sector were buying up all the uranium and causing the price to increase. So right now I said to my clients, look, if you've made eight to 10 times your money, friggin' take it. I mean, where are you going to get those sort of returns unless you've got, you know, you've got Elon Musk on speed dial? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. What about um, hydrogen stocks? Um, there's an interesting question here from yeah. uh, Nico. Um, like um, HZR, PRL, I don't know those personally, but yeah. um, there's a lot of interest now in um, particularly green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, isn't there? Well, Twiggy's gone to Queensland and has committed a, a billion dollars. So um, when you get ultra rich, you can have an opinion, you can go on the news, you can do whatever you want. I mean, Twiggy has put, what, half a billion dollars towards university. So, the, you know, the guy, the guy is as noble. And there's one of my these moments, Martin, I want to share with viewers. I was in a line at Diggers and Dealers in Kalgoorlie and Twiggy Forrest walked up to me and said, excuse me, Tony. And I thought, Jesus, this guy no, knows me. But unfortunately, I was wearing a name tag. <laughs> so anyway, so what was the question? Um, <laughs> Hayes, has, Hayes has done extremely well. PRL, looking at that hydrogen strategy. But to me, this is one of the biggest bandwagons you're ever going to see. I know there's a big push toward hydrogen vehicles, but you know we've hardly adopted electric vehicles here in Australia. And you've got uh, Kia are bringing out a car called, I think it's the EV6, where they're saying it's the strongest consumer response to a vehicle they've ever had. So to me, if you can make money out of hydrogen, you're doing extremely well. But the only thing these hydrogen companies are gonna produce is brokerage, and broken dreams so be very careful but hazer was one of the first adapters they've been through the absolute ringer prl looks a great trading stock but you know these people that actually produce hydrogen apart from twiggy forest where he knows my name are, are going to amount to to pretty much jack shit. <laughs> well thank you I yeah. think you call that as it is. That's pretty good. Yeah, that, well, that's it. Exactly. Now, uh, here's another one. What if all the workers leave as they lose their jobs in the iron ore industry? So two parts of that. You think iron ore cooked or do you think it's going to come back? And secondly, um, what's the impact on Western Australia? Well, we, we are the Goldilocks economy of Australia. As I said, we got to house the AFL grand final. Mark McGowan is leading uh, North Korea, according to Barnaby Butt. What an absolute concern that we live on the whim of what China wants to do. And what we've seen is the iron ore price can halve in no time. So I just think that we're incredibly vulnerable. The unemployment potential here in WA is absolutely frightening. And, you know, when you've got a, a slowing economy, even though you've had some, some supply constraints, once you actually open up, once you get supply free flowing, that's when I think the iron ore price is gonna head towards fair value. And I'm extremely worried about WA in terms of our iron ore revenue, our GST revenue, and the fact that we've had bugger all lockdowns, we've enjoyed this life. 
where it's only going to take one or two idiots to destroy it for all of us. So I'm certainly concerned about that on or price and the employment aspect. Yeah, it's interesting because, of course, the um, iron ore price came way down. It's come back up a little bit at the moment, but it's still way down from where it was. Interestingly, some of the coal numbers look a little better because they were also often quietly. China's now taking our coal again. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the uh, coal's death was greatly exaggerated, like the death of equity, equities was exaggerated in the early 70s. So, you know, we can have this push towards green energy, but it's going to take some time. And a lot of it is going to burn more CO2 and carbon emissions. So, you know, coal is an old dinosaur, but geez, the price is doing well. And the Australian coal producers are benef benefiting from it. Absolutely. Now, that's another one here from um, uh, from Bondi Steve about Westpac. I don't know whether you saw this, uh, Tony, but Westpac uh, basically came out today and said, well, we're going to have to write down our profits again because we're having to make provisions for um, some of the Royal Commission stuff, etc., etc., and other write-downs and all sorts of things, right? So they're actually going to take more of a hit on their profit, not necessarily directly on capital. Um, but the big banks keep doing this. They keep They keep finding excuses to write stuff down um so what does that tell you about um what they're up to i think it's it's a good move for being open about it but the australian market and institutions have this weird apathy for overpriced financial stocks and you know during the the uh, the covid smackdown i mean westpac's price was down to about 13 dollars 70 and they've had this massive recovery. But I think that these write downs, this admission on the provision of bad debts is only going to intensify what, once we start to have a not only a property crisis, but potentially a banking crisis. So, you know, Westpac have done the right thing, getting out all this bad news. But to me, our banking sector, you know, is one of the biggest shorts. Uh, you know, this is only general financial advice. But we haven't really seen a banking sector in crisis for many years. And you have to go way back to the GFC, which hopefully some viewers remember, where the NAB was only hours from going under. And I think now you've seen in Ireland where pensioners actually have to pay their money to have in a savings account. So to me, it's the perfect storm coming of financial sector weakness and all our banks are going to be affected. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, of course, the more that the Reserve Bank says our oh, banks are well capitalised and nothing to see here, the, <laughs> the more yeah. I want to look under the hood. And whenever, whenever I look under the hood, what I discover is that the profit improvement last time around was ultimately the reversal of provisions they made earlier. The margins are still being squeezed. They're putting more provisions aside for all of these remediation activities that are still bubbling through post, um, uh, you know, post the, the Banking Royal Commission. Um, and if you think about what's happening with funding costs, um, they had obviously the term funding facility, which was the cheap money from the Reserve Bank. But they're going to have to start tapping back into the bond markets and bond market rates are rising. That's going to put significant pressure on the margins of the banks and that's going to perhaps make it uh, more likely that we might even see out of cycle mortgage yeah. rate rises, irrespective of what the Reserve Bank actually does. And you know, both you and I think the Reserve Bank will probably have to move sooner than 2024. Oh, a absolutely. And um, I guess the main thing is that on Melbourne Cup Day, where we're all drowning our sorrows, yeah, the RBA will say, no, rates are on hold. But interestingly, banks are now offering a feature, well, they have for some time, where you can pay 750 bucks to ensure that your fixed rate won't change between now and you know four to six weeks. So you know I think the upward pressure on rates is truly frightening. And if you go back to those figures I mentioned, Martin, the average RBA cash rate is still over six percent. We're at point one, and to me the Auckland property market is like Sydney. And interest rates in New Zealand are now half a percent and you're paying up to 6% on a variable loan. So this is, this is beyond frightening. And I don't know what tools you've got left to curb inflation. And you look at the costs of things, there's inflationary pressures everywhere. 
So, you know, this has been a cheap money bonanza. Asset classes have gone through the roof, but now we're going to have to pay for it. And to me, you know, I'm just so relieved that, hey, I can enjoy my next five years or my midlife crisis because now fixed rates are great. Go and lock them in, Eddie. Just do it. Live life. Life's too friggin' short to be worried about variable rates. But, um, you know, to me, you know, the property market in Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth, you know, even though we're still paying six times price to income, you know, life's good over here. Why would you live in Sydney and Melbourne to be congested and pay up to 14 times where you're vulnerable to the interest rate increases, which are inevitable? Mm, well, certainly people are highly leveraged. I, I yeah. uh, made a report earlier uh, in the month and, uh, in fact, the AFR picked it up and they did a big piece on over leverage. And what's interesting about over leverage is it's not necessarily, you know, those in the new uh, suburban areas in those high growth corridors a lot of the people who are highly leveraged are the more affluent people who've got multiple properties investment properties and you know you just look at the multiples there particularly down the east coast makes my eyes water you know what happens if rates move up a bit and you know if, if prices go the other way we are really very very sensitive to to these things i think so it's it's worth keeping that in mind well, the, the other point is uh, there was articles on people withdrawing their buffers. I, I went to review my loan and the guy, he turned the screen to me and said, well, hey, do you realise you've got a 50 grand buffer? You know, which is 12.5% of this crappy one bedroom unit I live in. And I'm thinking, well, do I, you know, I go buy a new car? Do I go get some plastic surgery? Do I buy some suits? Um, why in the hell... Would you, would you go and withdraw that buffer? And what people on the eastern seaboard have done is gone out and bought depreciating assets where having a two-year buffer is your only protection against what, what's coming. And that, that's truly frightening because if you're managed to get so far ahead of your loan, why would you put your family at such financial risk? Nope. So, you know, I said no to the buffer. I said, no, nah, you know, there's no more crap you know, I need to buy apart from some Kmart cutlery or some plates. But, you know, to me, what, what I've learned over time is the more money you have, the greater stress in your life. And I'd rather, you know, be in a rowboat than the friggin' Titanic. So anyway, that's my view. And I believe that we'll start to adopt the European model. We'll start to realise that a cafe strip, an ocean view, an Audi Q5 or whatever, is not going to get you through life and you need to get back to simple things and you need to plan what you're doing and not get on this bloody hamster wheel which is what we're forced to do so uh, was that does that answer the question martin yeah no that's good no i mean it, it is exactly the point that people are actually oh, okay. highly leveraged and um yeah you know the, the you, you, you've made the other point, which I think is really important, on the hamster wheel, right? They've got to yeah. keep, keep they've got to keep running, and they've got to keep running faster and faster. And it's really interesting when I do my mortgage stress stuff. How many people don't realise that they've got a problem, yeah. <laughs> right? Now I measure mortgage stress on money in, money out. In other words, if they're spending more on a regular basis, including their mortgage or, or rent, compared with what's coming in, then I think they've got a problem, right? But many people yeah, don't think, think they've got. They yeah. don't think they've got no, a problem. We're all led to believe that you need to leave all this money for your kids. Well, <laughs> to me, that's that's a fugazi. That you know, that doesn't happen. And you know, I've actually come up with my three S's: it's sex, Shiraz, and steak. To me, nothing sparks more joy than good sex, good Shiraz, and a perfectly cooked steak. And we want to go out and buy a house in Sydney for one point three million dollars have an $800,000 mortgage and watch our life waste away. Anyway, that, that's my point, the three S's. <laughs> Very good. We got the third yeah. S. Great. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Uh, now, here's some, uh, I want to pick up the Evergrande story just a little bit. Cookie yeah. Boy actually gave us a, you know, we know 
the Evergrande is just the tip of the iceberg, right? We know that the property sector in China is massively over leveraged and we know that there are many property uh, companies now struggling, partly because of the um, red lines that uh, that China's put on the sector and, you know, partly the over leverage that they've got, partly the fact that they've built all this property that's vacant and all of those things are in play. So, um, People in the chat are saying, you know, is this the, is this going to be the black swan or the, you know, the, whatever swan colour you want, um, event that could actually trigger the cascade, that could trigger the property crisis here in Australia? Well, what's your read on it, Tony? Have you got a sense of, you know, uh, how contained is it? Is it likely to spill over? What do you think? I think, I don't think China has a choice but to ensure that this is kicked kick down the road because you've got to look at other property developers in China that they're in, they're in a similar uh, situation. I think that Australians, we've kind of ignored it in the fact that, hey, wait a sec, this is, this is in China. But, you know, it certainly has the potential for some contagion. It certainly work, looks a lot worse than what Lehman Brothers did. And if, if you look at the major what comprises the major indices where you've got financial stocks and major re resource companies? Yes, the ASX 200 is due for a 20% correction. And what I've done is I've bet against the US market and I've also taken out insurance on the Australian market falling through BBUS and BBOZ. And I think that we are clearly underestimating what is happening in China. I put that story up on my slideshow that, you know, all those bondholders didn't get paid and that was only yep. a few hours ago. So God knows what is happening through that. But in terms of a black swan event, do we really need it? We probably only need an exhaustion of buyers to see markets start to, to head towards any reasonable value and sentiment to come off. But to me, uh, you know, the warning signs were there prior to the GFC, but this certainly cannot be ignored. And what, what I'm telling my clients is that all the good news about ending lockdowns in this country is factored into the share prices. You know, you look at the share price performances of Flight Centre and other travel stocks, Qantas, it's all factored in. So markets are now priced for perfection and once this good news starts to come out, I think markets are going to fall. And I think there's an absolute load of worry when it comes to Chinese property, when it comes to Chinese companies that have built prop, you know, units in Lidcombe, where Lidcombe now is apparently part of the CBD, believe that or not. So, yeah, I think the property contagion threat is certainly real if it comes through Evergrande or even if it comes through a simple exhaustion of buyers. So certainly i'd be concerned mm. and it's interesting to reflect on some of the high-rise construction that's currently in play in sydney and melbourne is funded by some of that chinese money and chinese property developers so you know if china wobbles and the property sector comes off that can have a significant impact on some of the local stuff and bearing in mind that some of those um, uh, high-rise construction edifices are not that well built as we saw from uh, i think uh, this week new south wales reported that four in ten are actually um, high-rise actually have issues right so you know there's a lot of wobble in the in in the local market here and i think there's a connection there and look on that more broadly um you know you were talking i think a couple of shows ago about bbus and you've taken a position on the principle yeah. that the the market is is look, looking to come back are you still holding those or did you unwind them or what's the story there i i actually um due to other success uh, through my biotech stocks i actually took a, i reduced my holding in bbus i actually took a capital loss and immediately switch that to BBOZ. So uh, even though that trade went against me, you know, I'm still ensuring quite a sizable speculative portfolio. So for me, I took the right action. And even though, you know, I've had to come up with 20% deposit on this property, I'm not selling either BBUS or BBOZ 
because I think that 20% correction plus is certainly coming. So, you know, um, I know there's always the chat, well, I'm wrong. Yes, I went too early. But, you know, as I said, once sentiment turns, try getting out of some of this liquid property. There's just going to be no buyers. And suddenly, you know, you're down 30 40% with a mortgage you can't afford. So, um, yeah, I've had to cop a bit of a slapping. But, again, I've weighed that. You know, the benefit of my significant financial gains, you know, I've done the right thing. Mm. And uh, I remember you saying last time, you know, that it was very much a... Uh you know, a bit of a support mechanism in case the thing went the wrong way. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are still saying that the markets are way overvalued, that once the quantitative easing taps get turned back, um, once some of these other international factors get, get, get sort of on the table, the markets are over, overvalued. There are other people, and I was reading some today, saying, no, 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 there's plenty of upside in the markets from this point because interest rates are so low and everyone's going to bounce back from the, um, uh, from the COVID and everything. You know? And it's like, well, they can't both be right. <laughs> right? Well, so. well, the thing about stock markets is it's, you know, it's for looking so all this good news is already factored in markets know that the ease of lockdowns is coming they know that 80 percent double vax rates are coming it's all friggin factored in and and what we haven't had is a decent correction for some time so we've had all these new investors come into the stock market and you know the only way is up baby but again, you cannot drive a car for reverse forever. And I think that, you know, once good news comes out, markets are going to get sold off. The US Dow Jones is still at 34,000. The NASDAQ's massively overpriced. Our banking stocks have got the most huge headwinds coming up. Westpac have been the first to come out. Hey, it's priced for, for absolute perfection. And to me, the only pressure is to the downside. But, you know, the way I look at it is I like to have this insurance, but I don't want the market to crash. But if it does, I'm still going to parachute out a millionaire regardless as the world turns to shit. So you still have to look at those products. And, you know, I speak to some of your viewers that have, you know, a million dollars plus in the bank with no debt and every friggin' day they worry. I mean, as I said, Martin, life's too, life's too short for that. Why would you, you know, you worry about bank bailings, you worry about a banking crisis, that money has to go somewhere, interest rates at what, 0.1, you're getting no money on fixed interest. So no wonder people are taking risks. Absolutely. And it's understandable, you know, and in fact, the Reserve Bank is encouraging people to take more risk, saying you have to take more risk because rates are so low. They've, of course, created the problem. And one of the things I see in my surveys is people who used to rely on term deposits can't anymore. So they then try and figure out what to do. And that's where they get caught because they then get caught into things that, where the risks are a lot higher. And uh, quite often, you know, they don't actually understand what they're getting fully into, which is another problem, isn't it? When you when you are looking at, uh, you know, alternatives, you, you, you may not know. Um, and, and the other question I had on, on this was, you know, the Aussie dollar is sitting at, what, 73 at the moment. Um, what's your read on that? You know, th there were some people saying, oh, it should be down to sort of 60, 65. There are others saying, oh, no, 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 what with our iron ore exports and everything else, it should be... Um, you know, higher or, 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 or close to where it is. Um, I, I personally think there's probably some downside risk on the exchange rate, but what do you read? Oh, mass, massive downside risk because despite the 7,221 cryptocurrencies, the US dollar is still king. Uh, we are a commodity producing country. We sell our commodities to the likes of China. They can screw us over at any time. We have one of the craziest housing bubbles of all time. We have unemployment, which is set to skyrocket. We have a retail sector struggling. So I'm going to say, yeah, the pressure is certainly to the downside on our dollar. And our dollar, essentially, like the property market, like the stock market, like every other friggin' asset class, has been saved by COVID. 
you know, can you friggin believe it, Martin, <laughs> that we've, we've been saved by a global pandemic that's killing uh, lots of people. And um, yeah, I mean, I just had my second jab on Friday and I've only just recovered now. But um, yeah, who can believe it? I mean, mm. really? Well, and the fact of the matter is, what's really saved it is, you know, taxpayer money, isn't it, right? So, you know, they're basically writing a lot of debt and then the central bank's buying the debt. Um, interestingly, the reverse repos are through the roof here in Australia and in the US. So there's too much liquidity sloshing around the system, not going anywhere useful other than stoking, you know, maybe property and stoking um, uh, stock market prices. Um, so this stupidity is part of the problem, right? Because basically it's as you know, a bigger quantitative fest as we ever had. And now, of course, the interesting question is, will they be able to unwind it? Will they be able to pull it back? Um, and it's interesting that sometimes they're talking about tapering, but, you know, will they actually taper? Interestingly, in the UK, they're talking more seriously now. And in the US, they're talking about, well, maybe November time. Um, but it mm. seems to me trying to extract your way out of these massive QE programs and all the debt that's been issued at a time when interest rates are probably on the way up, it's going to be really tricky, isn't it? Oh, it's like trying to land an A380 without a guide and, and landing gear. To me, look, there's no precedent for what we're about to go through. I don't, I don't think money could become any cheaper. And you've got multiple speculative bubbles and you know it's only going to take an exhaustion of buyers not an increase in rates so i think the risks globally are certainly extreme i don't know people should look back at 2017 where we had multiple bubbles operating a lot of cryptocurrencies crashed property had a decent fall but even though we've re regained those 2017 highs I think the biggest risk to a family's balance sheet is coming out of COVID. I think the COVID cuddle has provided astronomical gains and security. You know, you've got all these government assistance, but as soon as the world gets back to normal, we're going to realise that there's nothing to support these asset prices. So, you know, people hopefully in the eastern states are getting their houses for sale now because as i said come spring come the hotter months it's going to be like trying to suck an ocean through a straw and with these apra even though apra are only lifting the stress test by half a percent as what i've gone through trying to get a friggin loan when i've got every asset it's only one and a half times what i earn i've had to struggle to get a loan I sure as hell worry about how other people are going to get a home loan, if not a loan to get themselves out of financial oblivion. To me, uh, you're not going to get an uglier set of circumstances. Hey, I'm, I've been wrong. This asset bubble has gone on way longer than what I thought, but it's going to be like a cray pot. When, when it pops, you just cannot get out of these things. And to me, you're going to have people stuck I mean, I look back at the vendor of my property that bought that house 12 years ago with the renovations has probably lost 20% of their money. And there's houses in Perth that are, are people have owned for 16 years and they haven't owned a cracker. They haven't earned a cracker on it. And they're still within 10 kilometres of the CBD and a decent beach. So what Eastern States investors and owners haven't seen is you know 15 years of pain absolutely and um you know it is interesting i was talking to somebody the other day who's a bit younger than myself and they've ever, only ever been in an environment where rates have come down where property prices have been booming where stock markets have been going up right and i i, I referred them to the four market crashes <laughs> that i've lived yeah. through right yeah. And they looked at me as though I got three heads. Um, you know, yeah. you mean things can go down? No, that's not the way the markets work. No, and we're, we're, we've, you know, we've been blessed. But um, you know, I look at it as tiptoeing through the tulips. You just can't see markets trade like this. Uh, leading up to the GFC, uh, viewers should realise bloody mortgage rates were heading towards ten percent. 
there was a view that the influx of self-managed super funds would protect the ASX 200 and the all odds. Yet, once the GFC came, it, the friggin' market halved. And we had the same in the NASDAQ bubble. The NASDAQ got absolutely poleaxed. So, you know, once markets start to fall, sentiment will snowball and suddenly, uh, you know, it's on for young and old. So I, I just haven't seen anything like it in my time as an advisor. Admittedly, uh, I'll be honest, COVID has seen a number of my stocks become wildly overvalued. I've used that to sell into it. But once the world gets back to normality, you're going to see price to income ratios get back to five to six times and PE ratios back to 12 to 13 times and not houses trading like Japanese stocks did in 1989, where PE ratios were 52, 52 times, Martin. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, admittedly, Japan survived the 87 crash through government intervention and housewives and crooks punting stocks. But to me, Sydney house prices, admittedly, I'm going to pay the coup two and a half grand. Sydney house prices are now trading like the Nikkei index did in 1989. And if that is the, the bigger, biggest get the hell out of this crap, I, I don't know what is. <laughs> Very well. Well, we're at the last uh, five minutes of the show, but uh, two oh, questions. Thank God for that. I'm having too much fun. Yeah, okay. Two questions. First question relates to silver and yeah. gold. Right, yeah. gold has gone literally nowhere in the last few months. In fact, it's down a bit. Um, yeah. Silver pretty much f following it. So all those people who were early in the year talking about gold at um, you know 3,000 or 4,000 seem to have been um, somewhat mistaken or at least uh, timing completely wrong what's your what's your view on gold? and you know you, you you talk about the gold miners earlier on yeah. but what about holding uh, precious metals is that in your portfolio or do you think it's important or how do you how do you regard it um you know i think i think that ultimately um precious metals are here to protect your money uh 700 ounces would buy you a house in the early 70s now 700 ounces of gold would buy you a two-bedroom knockdown in campsy but that has protected your money. Now, I own physical silver. I've got it hidden. To me, I think um, silver is probably, outside of uranium, one of the best precious metals uh, you could have. And um, just before my father died, actually, he said that we had a, a racing, horse racing stud in New Zealand, and he said that Bunker Hunt actually had horse races on our horses on our stud and uh, bunker hunt and the hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market uh way back and and they blew up but to me the silver market is easily manipulated and i advise my clients to have at least some of their wealth in physical silver the australian dollar gold price has still come up to about 2400 it does trade between those ranges but the multiple upside is obviously in a company like Northern Star, you know, five cents to $17, where I can identify emerging gold companies. But I think gold and silver, their time will come despite what the crypto people say. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. And, and the last question for tonight, inflation. Are we going to see inflation? Are we seeing inflation? Um, you know, and... and is the RBA targeting inflation differently? Are they reporting it differently? I mean, what's, the, what's, the, what's your perspective on the inflation story here? Well, you've got to love Cookie Boy, who puts up a tweet that um, fuel prices in Sydney at $2.04 a litre. Uh, everything is rising in price. You've got to look at the CPI. You've got to look at, at the basket. Um, I think we're certainly going to have inflation that's going to need higher interest rates before potentially we head into a deflationary environment. But my call all along, Martin, has been stagflation. So stagflation, for those viewers that don't know, is inflation with a recession. And to me, I mean, that's uglier than going to your six-year-old daughter's ballet concert. You just want to get the hell out of there. 
you know, we've got to go back to the 70s where I remember, you know, Cherry Hills, Northern Beaches, we were queuing for fuel. You know, you had odds and evens. Um, you know, then we had periods where you could get, you know, 16 to 18% on a term deposit. So this generation has been used to higher asset prices, cheap money, but, you know, stagflation, the risks are rife in the US, the risks are huge here, and the only thing that can curb this is higher interest rates to assist with inflation, and again, um, take the lead from the Bank of New Zealand, you know, the New Zealand economy where rates are half a percent and some poor people are going to have to pay 6% on a friggin' $800,000 mortgage where you're paying post-tax 60 grand upwards uh, principal and interest. So this we're heading into some of the darkest times of what we're seeing in the economy. But, hey, let's just keep this party rolling because, yeah, it's been a blast. But, you know, <laughs> shit, Martin, it's, it's yeah, not going to end well. Yep. And, you know, the bank of mum and dad is going to collapse. Hey, it's the ninth biggest bank in Australia. Geez, that has got to be cause for concern. You know, I don't know why people put up with Sydney and Melbourne. I was a police officer in Sydney for eight years. As sure as hell, I don't want to live there. Hey, I'll probably pay too much for a place in Perth, but um, I'm going to love the next five years. <laughs> and uh, Jason M, thanks for the, for the super chat. You asked um, where... Is this going to hit the most? You know, if the property bubble pops, my answer to that is: I think you've got to look in a number of different places. But high rise, of course, is already uh, in difficulty. Uh, a lot of people who've bought recently, top end of the market, are going to s find some pain. But I also think that um, you know, the middle market is where a lot of this comes because that's where a lot of the leverage is. And um, I think that you're going to see some casualties around the place. It will take some time, um, and it won't be everywhere. But uh, if you bought sensibly and you bought the right property in the right place, hopefully Tony has, then yeah. you're more protected. But there are a lot of people who actually have bought way, way in late in the cycle at the top of the market um, with high leverage on the assumption that everything is going to go perfect from this point. If it doesn't go perfectly from this point, they're the ones that are going to get hit. And I'll also make a point, a lot of the first time buyers who have actually been um, buying now are walking into a death trap in my view oh, and it's it's one of the saddest things you'll ever see and you know i've i've had a good education with policing with psychology and you know what we're going to see over the next few years martin is going to absolutely break my heart but um you know people have the opportunity to get educated by this channel or they can watch squid game and look at whatever they want to binge next but to me it's a sad state of affairs coming and every bubble will burst, but this is going to be the mother of all um, bubbles that are going to burst. And there's no way of avoiding this. The RBA and your bank are going to say, hey, you took out a loan for 30 years. Um, you're going to pay under 3% for your mortgage because that is not going to happen because the RBA has to manage an economy, not a Sydney, Melbourne bubble. And that's end of story. End of story. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. RBA, please note. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're smarter than me. They've got all these degrees, which I liken to a, a set of handcuffs, you know, anyway, which I miss for obvious reasons. But anyway. <laughs> Tony, I appreciate yeah. your time tonight. Thank you very much. You've uh, uh, always, um, uh, you know, provocative, always thought provoking. And, um, you got your full bingo card, so well done. Thank you for that. Thank you. And um, we'll put the links and things below if people want to uh, follow up with some of those uh, thoughts afterwards. But I appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, and I look forward to the next one. Yeah, we'll do it. Hopefully before the end of the month. We'll, we might do one around the end of the year and, you know, have a yeah, bit let, of a... Let, let's do risk, that. And you know, retrospect on this year and a thought about next year. And I'll come up with some new one-liners, I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Take care. Bye -bye. Absolute pleasure. See you, Bye. Martin. See you, viewers. 
There you go, so that's uh, great. Now, just a few things before I uh, sign off. Um, I had a few people ask about John Adams. John Adams and I are talking. Uh, we hadn't uh, been able to make a show because of, of, of social distancing. Hopefully that will change very soon now with things opening up. So uh, yeah, we haven't had a falling out. We're actually still actively talking about uh, a whole bunch of things. And um, he's quite active um, doing other things as well and you know, all sorts of things. So anyway, that's, so that's the good news there. Um, watch for that on the other channel. And then the other thing just to say that the next week um, I've got to Veronica Morgan coming back to talk about buyer's agents and who are buyer's agents, what are buyer's agents, what they do, how you should use a buyer's agent and we'll probably get some views from her on some of the property related issues that are very uh, top of mind at the moment. So mark your diaries for that. And I will just uh, warn you that in a few weeks time I will be having Steve Keen live. He's coming on um, in, in a few weeks time to talk about uh, a bunch of things. So that should be fun. And uh, I've got a few other people that also uh, lined up in the next few weeks. So keep watching the shows. Um, I want to thank you very much for your uh, chat tonight, all the contributions in the, in the um, uh, super chat and everything else. And uh, great to have so many people on. We we'll look forward to seeing you this time next week. In the meantime, of course, check the other shows out. Uh, we'd make shows most days, but we'll be back here next Tuesday for another one. So take care. See you soon. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, signing off.